الشيطان العين الرجيم بفضل الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله والحمد حقه كما يستحقه حمدا كثيرا الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله اللهم العن أول ظالم ظلم حق محمد وآل محمد وآخر تابع له على ذلك اللهم العن العصابة التي جاهدت الحسين وشايعت وبايعت وتابعت على قتلها اللهم العنهم جميعا اللهم العن قتلة أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام ثم الصلاة والسلام على خير خلق الله أجمعين محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين واللانة الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين Last night we introduced the discussion with the narration where Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam narration where Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam says halaka fiya rajulan that two people halak means I said means perished but they have come at a loss two types of people one that has extremity when it comes to the love of Amir al-Mu'minin, which we discussed last night. And the other one, Mubghidun Qal, which also means someone that hates the Imam in the extremity. With this extremeness that they have when it comes to the hatred. But why could such a man that possesses such good qualities. And if you are to look at the excellence within this man, you would only find him second to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam and no one else. How could someone of this caliber, of this standard, be so detested and hated by people for so long. See, one person came up to the fourth holy Imam, Al Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin, alayhi salam. And he asked him, Why? He says, Lima abghadat Qurayshun. Aliyah. Why did Quraysh hate Ali so much? It's a question people would ask. Why would this person hate that person? What is the reason they hate them? What is the reason they hate him so much? Specifically Amir al-Mu'minin. See, the Imam replied with two things. He says, قَالَ لِأَنَّهُ أَوْرَدَ أَوَّلُهُمُ النَّارِ that the first one, first reason, is the first ones, or the foremost of Quraysh, because of Ali was sent to hell. And the latter ones, okay, when we say Ar, Ar is generally associated with what? Ar, it associates where it shows people's deficiencies and people's uh, uh, basically what they want to cover and conceal. The hidden things about them, exposing them. So if we take a look at the first part, where it says about the foremost, the, the, the first ones that came through, the Amir al-Mu'minin sent them to the Nar, to hellfire. And we looked at the battle of Badr. In the battle of Badr, the chieftains or the champions, as they are called, meaning champion, we say champion, our, the usage of the word champion in English 
is someone that wins a competition, but a champion is also someone that is a protector and a supporter. So that's why the word batal means someone that is a protector and a supporter, that strengthens you. So a champion is also used, in case some people think I'm using the word incorrectly, but a champion and these supporters of Quraysh, these chiefs of Quraysh, sent them one after the other. See, because you need to understand Quraysh were able to mend everything. But Umayyah fixed everything later. You know, after the conquest of Mecca, when I say them, they managed to make all the criminals into good people. Through narrations, they were able to change the reputation of Abu Sufyan. They were able to change the reputation of Hind. They were able to change the reputation of Muawiyah. They were able to change the reputation of Khalid ibn al-Walid and Marwan ibn al-Hakam. Yeah, Marwan ibn al-Hakam is one of those people that was not only cast out and exiled from the peninsula, but Rasulullah had said for him never to be allowed to return. And they let him back in and they fixed his story up as well. They were able to change everyone's reputation. But if you ask even the lovers of Banu Umayyah, if you ask them about Walid ibn Utba, Utba ibn Rabi'a, Shayba, you ask them about these people, are they in heaven or in hell? They have to swallow it and say they're in hell because they were killed fighting Rasulullah. And they were killed by the sword of Ali. So we couldn't even repair their reputation. They're stuck. Even though when I mentioned Abu Jahl, when they speak about him, they give him such great respect. But they still know Abu Jahl was killed as a kafir. Amir al muminin put this on him. He marked this upon them. He sent them to hell. There was no way that they could get out of this. And this really tormented them. They held this against him. They hated him for this. And it's the longest running hatred you could find. It was specifically against Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. Also, he exposed them. If you look at a lot of the stories, where he exposed all of Banu Umayyah, even because the narration says Quraysh, the other people in Quraysh. You know, when you had someone that was sitting in the seat of Khilaf, Hussain Amman Khalif, Someone like Umar ibn al-Khattab would say he was the Khalif. He would tell the people he's Khalif. He's on the mambar, giving a sermon in Masjid Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And a man says to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. This is how they used to refer to him. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, that we have no water. There must have been a shortage of water. We have not been able to do ghusl if we have entered the state of Janah, but we are in that pure impurity. So what do I do? So then Omar replies, he says, I have been without ghusl for so long. I, th- I forget what the narration says, how many days. So he's been sitting on the mambar of Rasulullah in the state of Janaba. And a man says, Ya Amir al what about the verses of tayammum in the Quran? To do tayammum if there's no water. Even this he was absent-minded about. The people used to correct him. But many times he would be corrected by Amir al muminin And he would say, Law la Ali, la halaka Umar. If it wasn't for Ali, Umar would have perished. He was saved. And this exposed him for what he was. In one case where there was a woman that was what? Afflicted. She had... An affliction in her head. In other words, what you would say today, we would say she had mental issues. But she had affliction. She wasn't someone that was rational. And they accused her of adultery. So Omar said to stone her. Amir al-Mu'minin said, you can't stone her. She wasn't in the right state of mind when she acted. So he was always exposing them and showing them for what they faults were and even in a more apparent way was the case in the battle of Safin where Amr ibn al-As Amr ibn al-As went to fight him to duel the imam even though he was no match for the imam 
that he was in a position whether he was in a duel with the imam and he exposed himself whether he exposed his private parts or he took off his clothes in order to flee from the imam he exposed himself so causing him out of fear to expose himself you know this is another thing where it's a form of degradation it's a form of humiliation that he has put them in this state and even when Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam when he asked his to be killers, those that surrounded him on the day of Ashura. He said, on what condition, what is it that makes you want to kill me or take my life? What is it that's brought you to find this as acceptable or as permissible? Because they made it permissible. They were killing the Imam. That's why if you notice, when I introduced my lecture, I used the excerpt from Ziyarat Ashura, I used specifically the excerpt because he says, What? Allahumma al'ana al'asabat al-lati, what? Jahadat al Hussein. That these people that kill, came to kill Imam Hussein, they came in the form of what? Jihad. They came fi sabilillah. They were killing Abu Abdullah al Hussein, qurbatan ila Allah ta'ala. That their aim was to kill him, to gain proximity to Allah. What kind of an account, how do you achieve such an understanding? And they res responded by what? We will kill you because we hate your father. And this is the primary thing we're against. We are here to take back the right that he took from who? He took from the lives that he took. And that's why Yazid ibn Muawiyah actually said it explicitly. He said, only if who a shiakhi fi badr, he's talking about who? His forefathers, only if they were present to witness this victory that I've killed Abu Abdullah al Hussein. It was all about this vengeance, this hatred that brought about this. Hello, I'm going to talk about the actual discussion of the course that led towards the martyrdom and inshallah we'll be talking more about the causes of this opposition to Amir al-Mu'min on the final night tomorrow night of the discussion of the martyrdom of, of Amir al-Mu'min alayhi salam I mentioned earlier that the imam had been told by Rasulullah that he would be martyred this had been given to him and after a long time or 25 years where his right was taken and he was in his home, he was not even given a job. Could you imagine under the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, under the Khilafah of Umar ibn al-Khattab and Uthman, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, was not even given the post of a police officer, not even the most menial task, nothing. Instead, he was a farmer. He was digging wells because he was not fit. And this was apparent, even if you read historically in the books, and if you read about the history of the Khilafat of Umar ibn Khattab, it said that when Umar was looking for people to govern and people to be the administrators in, in, in part of the government, he said he did not find four statesmen equal to Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan and Amr ibn al-As. And Abdul Rahman ibn Awf and Mughira ibn Shu'bah. He said he did not find four men equal to them as statesmen. The weird thing that comes here is when it came to the time of appointing the committee of the sixth, the only one out of these four that he chose was who? Abdul Rahman ibn Awf. He didn't even choose Muawiyah or Amr ibn Al-As to be part uh, of the committee of six. He didn't even choose them at this, this point. So even there, it contradicts what his statement was. But during his time, he would never let Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib salam, be even recognized. And the Battle of Safin took place. During the Battle of Safin, because I'm missing a few of the battles, but we're talking about specifically the Battle of Safin, because the Khawarij were fighting alongside Amir al-Mu'mineen. They were with him. Muawiyah came out with the spears and on the spears he had placed the Qur'an. He had placed a few 
papers or whatever they put at the time and, and in, they resembled the Qur'an to say this is the Qur'an, let the Qur'an judge between us. So the people said, let's stop fighting. Why? Because he's put the Qur'an to judge between us. We already determined that he's the bad guy. Everyone knows he's a bad guy. In fact, if I was to ask you to go research and find me historically any evidence where he was a good person... Did you know if you go research other books, not the Shia books, other books about Muawiyah to find a good hadith about him? They'll say, this is one of the, the strongest ones they bring. They go, the Prophet says that blessed is the one that establishes the first naval force. And as you know, Muawiyah established the first naval force. This is one of the hadiths they bring forward. There's nothing good. This man was around at Rasulullah last time. He was the standard bearer in Uhud. Sallallahu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. He was the standard bearer in Uhud for the army of Abu Sufyan. So then the Khawarij said to Amir al Mu'mineen, they said, No, you're going to have to stop fighting or we will refuse to fight. So Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, stopped the fight because his army had been broken apart. And then, after the fight stopped, the war stopped, the Khawarij blamed him for stopping the war. And they said, you are the blame for stopping this war. He said, you requested this. They said, you did. You have done an injustice. Repent to Allah. He said, astaghfirullah rabbi wa atubu ilayh. They said, see, this is ahtiraf. You have confessed that it was your fault. He said, you asked me to remember Allah, so I did. You asked me to mention the name of Allah, so I did. And then after that, they came about with the battle of Nahrawan, which is the battle that they led against Amir al-Mu'mineen. And in this battle, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, killed so many of them in this battle. So everyone that was a member of their families had at least one family member. And these people were tribal. And there's always vengeance. And these people kept this in their head that they wanted to repay, make him pay for this or take their right back from him for this. So this is where people that had come into the ranks, people like Abdul Rahman Ibn Muljim al-Muradi had come into the ranks, was of those that had planned on killing the Imam. Remember Abdul Rahman Ibn Muljim al-Muradi hadn't lost anyone directly through Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was just someone that was bent on hatred. Someone that wanted vengeance from the Imam. Just based to be part of this tribe and to be part of the people that he's with just so he can take vengeance. So when it came time when Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam was being given bay'ah, when he was being given uh, allegiance, Amir al-Mu'mineen looked at Abdul Rahman. Because Abdul Rahman, these people, they come. They're always there um, to give allegiance. They're always there. Even if you notice when someone... For example, I was reading in the paper today that, um, that Michael Gida, who was the one that murdered Samantha Knight back in 1986, he's a pedophile. And he, he murdered this young girl. They say he's due for parole. He only got 16 years because he was white. Um, he's due for parole uh, in June. And the parents are talking about this, that this person should not be released. Not only this, this person did not even confess to, the, to where, what he did and where the body was. And they still only gave him 16 years. And he was actually uh, able to get out for parole after 11 years. So he got a pretty good deal for what he did. But anyway... If you look at his history the whole time, do you know where he was? When they were searching for the body, he was always in the rescue parties, the search parties. He was always around when the parents were there getting interviewed that they'd lost their daughter. If you look at the, the footage back in the late 80s or 90s, he was always sitting with the parents. He was always around them, involved. These people, they like that. They like to be around and they're the first ones that turn. And they're the first ones that turn when the time comes. Abdul Rahman came and gave allegiance to Amir al-Mu'mineen. He was there 
And not only when he gave allegiance, it was just a normal bay'ah like everyone else. When we talk about bay'ah, just to give you an idea, when people ask, what is bay'ah? Bay'ah is basically when you take the, it's generally it's given where your hand goes beneath the other person's hand. You shake his hand, in no a matter where you put his hand above yours, that you are now my leader. You are above me, I've given you allegiance. You know, I've given you um, homage, I've paid you homage as they say. That I'm under you, you're my commander. And he said this. So Amir al-Mu'minin made him make an oath. He said that he would not break this covenant. Because he made an agreement and he would not be treacherous. He would not betray. So Abdul Rahman did. He agreed to this. He made this uh, agreement in this manner. But then afterwards, what did he do? Huh? He said, Ya Amir al-Munin, you only did this with me. I never saw you do it with anyone else. So Amir al-Munin is doing it for a specific reason. And then the Imam said, said to him, For Wallah, I swear to God that you will not fulfill this agreement that you have just given. He let him know the reason he's making him alert of this. You know, he's given as many uh, proofs and arguments against him to prevent him from doing this. But Abdul Rahman was so uh, staunch in this direction and not changing his mind. Now, some people of his near ones, remember when we talk about, um, last night we spoke about people knowing what, some, in some cases where people know what's going to happen in the future. Where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa, alayhi wa, alayhi wa sallam, told for example Ammar ibn Yasir that you would be killed You'll be killed in a battle and the last, your last sustenance from this world will be laban, will be yogurt or milk. He actually told him this. That there were things where Amir al-Mu'minin would tell his companions like Maytham al-Tamar how he will be killed. We, we know that these things occurred and these things did happen and these things were said. So they said, Ya Amir al-Mu'minin, they said, why don't you kill him before he kills you? In one of the narrations, he says, "Aqtulu qatili," you want me to kill my murderer? Firstly, that was one narration. Another one, he says, "La yujuz al qisas qabl al jinaya," which is a fundamental thing. Do not, we do not punish before the crime has been committed. You know, we don't take, for example, in the West. You know, they have intent. I mean, have you ever seen when there's a charge? They have in the law. There's intent. That I had criminal intent. I had the intent to kill someone. We don't have that in Islam. We don't have, so you can charge someone with the intent to kill. It's either they killed or they didn't kill. This did take place or it did not take place. You can't say this person was intent on killing. It's either he killed or he didn't kill. In this case, we don't punish someone. You can't execute someone, inshallah, Tomorrow night, just so I can give you a perspective of how this will all link up. Tomorrow night we're talking about the causes of the hate. The night after, we will talk about the means and the aim. That's not related to the subject of martyrdom, but this is related to a very important concept that actually exists, that people go by, where they think that the ends always, the end is always justified, justifies the means. So anyway... So Amir al-Mu'mineen there said, I will not punish him before he commits the crime. So on the night of the 19th of Shah Ramadan, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam used to, on different nights, have iftar at different one of his children's houses. And on this night, when he was having his iftar, narration says that his daughter, Umm Kulthum's house, it says that she put for him there was barley bread, and there was yogurt, and there was salt. And then he said to her, three types of food. That's all he had. And he said, I will not eat until you remove one of the three. So she said, I tried to remove the salt. He said, no. So he said, I took the, the yogurt. Because obviously the yogurt's the most, most thing with flavor on that table. Instead, he broke his fast using the barley bread and the salt. And he spent the night in prayers and in reflection and in thought. 
They say he recited Surah Yasin. He had a small a nap. He didn't. He had a small nap at the point, and then during the small nap, the Imam saw a dream. And he said, I saw in this dream that Jibra'il took two stones from what? The mount of Abi Qubais, Jabal Abi Qubais, which is right next to where the Kaaba is. He took two stones from this, took them up to the heavens and smashed them together. And he said, and from this, all the debris and all the specks that came from this dust went into Mecca and into Medina and into all their homes. So they ask him, what is the meaning of this dream? He said, if my dream is truthful, then I will be killed. And there will not be a house in Mecca or Medina, except trial, tribulation and grief will enter them because of me, because of what's happened to me. In other words, you're about to experience something new, the coming of Banu Umayyah in their real force after I am gone. Amir al-Mu'minin was still holding them at bay. So anyway, the time was nearing towards the prayer, Fajr prayers. So Amir al-Mu'minin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam prepared himself to go to the masjid. Upon going to the masjid, as he was leaving, they say inside the courtyard there were geese. And these geese began to scream and shriek. So remember... When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, they say when he used to, the narration say when he used to walk through the street, the trees would lean towards him. They're affected, nature's affected by Hujatullah al Khalq. Allah's representative on the earth, when he walks on the earth, everything in existence is subjective to him. Everything is, is uh, subordinate to him. Even when Abu Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam was was killed, they say that the, you flip a stone, there was blood beneath this stone. That everything in the environment would change upon the martyrdom of Abu Abdullah al Hussein. So at the time of Amir al Mu'min leaving, even the geese could feel the emotion and the mood at this time. And then they say. In the narration that he arrived at the gate, as he was leaving, the gate closed upon or hung up or caught onto his, you know how sometimes you're walking out and your coat catches onto the the hook on the gate or the, the closing mechanism. So at this point when he got caught, Amir al-Mu'minin fixed his clothing and headed towards the masjid. And he entered Masjid al-Qufa, and those that have been inside Masjid al Kufa would know that it's a very huge masjid, it's a big masjid. He entered and he saw the people asleep. And out of his good character and good conduct, he woke people up to get up so they can pray. And amongst those that were sleeping was Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim al Muradi. And he was sleeping on his stomach, and concealed under his clothing was a sword that he intended to kill the Imam. This is someone that's entered the house of God. He does not respect the house of God. Has no regard for the prayers because the imam is going to get up and pray. And forget the fact that sometimes you may look at someone. You may not like someone. You might hate them but you say, hold on. I'm going to let this go because he's in the Kaaba. You know, for example, when you're in Mecca. Al Mukarram, and you see someone in Masjid al Haram, even when you see, even if you see one of these people that hate you, that call you a kafir, a rafidi, you say he's in the Haram, he's in Masjid al Haram, he's under the sanctity of the Kaaba. The holiness, this place is sanctified. So you treat them with this respect because of the Kaaba. Because of where you are, when you're in Baytullah, when you're in the Masjid, you have this respect. Yet this man had no respect and no regard for this. And even though the Imam had agreed with him that he would not betray in any way. So he awaited the Imam until the Imam began his prayer. See, not even to face him face to face. He wouldn't even strike. This is the fear that he had of the Imam. This is how the Imam's presence was so great. That he didn't even strike the imam while the imam was standing. 
even though he had his back to him, because he's praying, he didn't strike him in ruku'ah. He waited till the imam was in sujood. And as the imam raised his head from the sujood, this is when Abdul Rahman struck him at this point. And Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, at this point said the famous words He says that I have succeeded, I am victorious by the Lord of the Kaaba. That I have succeeded. He knew what he had done in his life, he knew how successful he had been in this world. Inshallah, tomorrow night we'll continue our discussion about the causes that led towards this hatred and we'll finish about discussing the last moments of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. And we ask Allah Azza wa Jal on this night that we are granted the opportunity to visit the grave of Amir al Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam and given his intercession on the Day of Judgment. والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى اللهم على محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين